Look, it is just a fact. We evolved eating meat. Eating meat has contributed to our development as a species, and it's an important part of our history and culture, as well as giving us nutrients. We ought to eat meat. No, no, no. It's a fact that we do not have the necessary teeth or claws, unlike carnivores, to consume meat naturally. We have flat teeth with no real canines, and we don't need to eat meat to survive. We ought to go vegan. Which person argues correctly? David Hume says they're both wrong. This is a video tutorial for A-level philosophy students exploring David Hume's is ought problem, also called Hume's law, gap or guillotine. By the end of this lesson, we'll be able to describe, understand and apply the problem with specific examples for how it impacts utilitarianism and natural moral law. Scottish Enlightenment philosopher David Hume commented in his work A Treatise of Human Nature that many moral thinkers start their argument talking about what is the case, like we saw in the intro, and then all of a sudden start talking about what ought to be. This, he argued, represented a logical error. Just because something is a particular way does not mean it ought to be that way. This is Hume's is ought problem. You cannot logically move from a description of how things are to a prescription of how things should be. This is because there seems to be a gap between facts and values. Facts and values are just different things. Consider an example used by Stephen Law in his book The Philosophy Gym of two aliens who witness a mugging. They see the facts of the situation, an object taken from one human by another, the thief fleeing the scene, the victim angry and upset. But when their earthling companions add that what they have seen is also wrong, they might well be puzzled. Where in this situation is the wrongness? That wasn't observable. Isn't that something we've added to the situation, rather than something we've found in it? Wrongness is a value we give to particular facts, but it's not found in the facts themselves. This is Hume's point. There is a jump in logic to move from statements of pure fact to statements of value. Consider these two examples. Can you see how only one of these logically follows? Notice in argument one, all the statements are descriptions. They are factual claims about the world. The first two, the premises of the argument, logically lead to the third, the conclusion. But notice the second argument. The conclusion is not a fact, but a value. It is a prescription, not a description. It is saying what we ought to do, not what the world is like. Now, hopefully you can see what would actually follow from these premises. It would be valid to conclude that stealing is illegal. But saying that stealing is illegal is just another fact about the world. It is not an ought. Sure, we often think we ought to follow the law, but not always. In fact, we might think we ought to ignore unjust laws. So what is legal is not the same as what we ought to do. What the law is, is a fact. What we ought to do is a value. One does not automatically lead to the other. If we want these arguments to make sense, we have to add an additional premise that allow for the conclusion to be supported. For example, you ought to act legally. Now the conclusion is logically supported, but notice the nature of the additional premise. It is a value, not a fact. This supports the idea we cannot get an ought from an is. If Hume is right, and many think he is, then arguments we make in everyday life that move from facts to values are simply illogical, or contain hidden, unstated premises that are actually values, not facts. Think of every time a parent has said to their child, there are people starving in the world, so you should finish eating your Brussels sprouts. According to Hume, this argument makes an unjustifiable logical step, from an is to an ought. Now, in reality, when someone says this, there is a hidden premise, something like, you shouldn't waste food when people are starving. But this is not a fact found in the world. This is a value we're placing onto the world. It comes from us. Without it, this argument simply does not work. Why? Because you cannot get an ought from an is. Let's have a go at a task to try and make this a bit clearer in your minds. Look at these arguments that all move from an is to an ought. They have a fact as a premise and a value as a conclusion. What hidden premises are required to make these arguments logically follow? These are not meant to be good arguments. The only purpose these have is for you to distinguish between facts and values and to understand Hume's point that values cannot come from facts alone.
At this stage, hopefully you understand Hume's point here. If we base our arguments on only a series of facts, then we cannot get to a value. In moral philosophy, what kinds of theories does this problem affect? Take a look at your meta-ethics map. Which position claims moral truths are based on facts that we can observe in the world? That's right, naturalism. Okay, let's then apply the Aesop problem to two popular naturalistic theories, utilitarianism and natural moral law. Utilitarianism claims that what is good is pleasure and what is bad is pain. Why? Because we can observe this a posteriori. We can see people pursue pleasure and avoid pain. This is a fact about the world. This fact is then the basis for their moral theory. However, Hume states we cannot base values such as pleasure is good on facts like people value pleasure. Just because it is the case that someone values pleasure does not mean they ought to. This is a logical jump that is not justified. However, we might be tempted to push back against Hume here. Utilitarians seem to be claiming something far more significant than arguments like we eat meat, therefore we should eat it, or stealing is illegal, so we shouldn't steal. Morality isn't based on a claim about our current or past behaviour or societal norms, but something much deeper about our psychology. They are saying it is a fact that all humans value the same thing, pleasure, and we all avoid the same thing, pain. This is why we should value it. It's a fact about us as humans. It is universal. Sam Harris, despite not technically being utilitarian, makes a similar argument in his book The Moral Landscape, but replaces talk of pain and pleasure with well-being. Yet it's not clear this is enough to bridge the is-ought or fact-value gap. We might argue that not everyone values pain and pleasure the same, but regardless, even if they did, and we could state it was a universal fact about humans that we all value pleasure, this still does not logically entail that pleasure is objectively good. All this gets us is that it is subjectively good for all humans, but not good objectively, like moral realists, such as utilitarianism, claim. What is objectively moral surely cannot be based on majority view. Perhaps we're all mistaken in what we value. Why would us believing something be what makes something objectively true? What if everyone thought eating babies was good? Would that make it good objectively? We cannot move from a description about what people value to a prescription of what they should value. In other words, we still cannot get an ought from an is. Natural moral law claims that what is good is fulfilling our God-given function or telos. Why? Because we can observe a posteriori that we have been designed to fulfill certain functions, like to live, reproduce, learn. Our function is a fact about the world. However, Hume states we cannot base values such as reproducing is morally good on the fact that we have a function to reproduce. Just because it is the case that we have a particular function, and this is debatable, does not mean we ought to fulfil it. This again is a logical jump that is without justification. The natural moral law theorists may consider that they have some options open to them in responding to Hume that utilitarians lack. Natural moral law is a religious theory that makes the claim that we have a God-given function. This means the is we are using to drive an ought from is from God, an omnipotent, omnibenevolent, omniscient being. This justifies the move from is to ought. When we say something is good, we just mean it matches what God has designed us to do. This gives us all the justification we need to derive values from facts. However, there's a notable problem with such a move. It rests on a highly contentious claim that God exists. We may find arguments for God's existence in philosophy of religion, like the cosmological argument, unconvincing. Or we could have independent reasons for denying God's existence, such as the problem of evil. Furthermore, even if we accept God's existence, it isn't clear we are truly deriving a value from a fact, and not actually starting with a hidden value. Consider this argument. We have a God-given function to reproduce, therefore we should reproduce. Isn't there an assumed premise here? Something like, we should follow our God-given function. This premise is a value, so we're not deriving our conclusion from solely facts. Without the hidden premise, then what significance does having a function from God have? Perhaps we still cannot get an ought from an is. What do you think? Where would you take the discussion next? Do you think there's a way to get an ought from an is? Can we defend utilitarianism or natural moral law successfully against Hume? Let me know your thoughts and I'll see you in the next video.